All right, who wants to know what the future is? I do. What I hope to convince you of in the next few minutes is that we're actually on the verge of a technology that will let us predict the future. And you think this is crazy. Well, humans have been concerned and actually obsessed with trying to predict the future for as long as humans have walked this planet. This is the oracle of Delphi, high priestess, a virgin, of course. She sits above these, this crevasse here with vapors coming up. And the way you would go and get your fortune told is you go to her, and these vapors cause her to see visions. And you have your fortune told, and you know what the future is. Biblical prophecies. The Bible is full of telling the future, ending with perhaps the biggest prophecy of all, the last judgment. Some of these prophecies, some of these writings were further expounded upon by Nostradamus. And depending on your point of view, he was right, or maybe not. Even today, we're obsessed with telling the future, whether it's a fortune cookie, tarot cards, or if you like technology, building time machines. What better way to tell the future than to go to the future and come back? Well, let me tell you about how we actually predict the future. The human brain is a prediction engine. This is what it has evolved for. Yes, it does many things, but fundamentally, what I want you to remember is that the brain predicts the future. Look at this task. We do it every single day. Try crossing a street in New York. I guarantee you, if you're not predicting the future, you will not be surviving to pass on your genes. <laughs> we don't even think about it. But if we're animals that just react to the environment as things come at us, it's completely hopeless. The only way you're able to cross the street is by making mental models of what's happening and your mind and your body are staying one step ahead of it. That's how we got here. That's how every animal got here. It's not a human trait. Every animal can do this. Catching a frisbee. Dogs can do it. Some humans can't do this. Well, how would you go about catching a frisbee? Well, if you're a physicist, you might calculate the differential equations and compute the trajectory and move yourself to where you need to be. That's not how a dog does it, and that's not how most of us do it. The fact is, we're constantly making predictions. We don't even need to think about it. Turns out this problem was actually solved uh, about 10 years ago when a scientist looked at what animals and people actually do when they're tracking moving objects. And it's not that they're trying to calculate where the ball or the frisbee is going to be. It's actually a very simple technique, which is you move your body to keep the ball or the frisbee in a constant location or a constant trajectory on your retina. And if you do it properly, you don't need to think about it, you will end up where the ball is. Sounds pretty neat. Is it a prediction task? You bet. They're more complicated prediction tasks. Okay, catching a, a frisbee or a fly ball, it's difficult. We can all learn it. This is a more difficult prediction task, though. And the in interesting thing about predicting this type of outcome is you don't get reinforcement from it until the very end of the game. So if you think about chess, how is it that Kasparov or Karpov could think through 50, maybe 60 moves and you don't know if you're doing the right thing until you get to the very end, how can you possibly learn about the world like that? You do 60 things, and then you find out if you did it right or not. Well, it turns out that that's not exactly what they're doing. It's not at all what they're doing. What they're doing is they have a prediction model. They have a model of the chessboard. They have a model of what each other is going to do, and they're constantly updating that. And they're behaving as if they get closer and closer to their goal. And this is how we all work. It's not necessarily playing chess, but it's the exact same process. We don't just react to the environment. We go through, and we're constantly making predictions about the world. Same thing with a rat. Rat trying to find this piece of cheese in this maze. It's exactly the same problem. It doesn't know that it's succeeded until it's achieved the goal. How can it possibly get there? 
Does it just randomly search around until it just stumbles upon it? It may look like that. But we now know, studying exactly how rats learn, that they learn much faster than that. You can calculate that if they were just wandering around randomly, how long would it take them to get to the cheese? In fact, they do much better than that. And the reason is, is because they have mental models in their heads about their environment. And the interesting thing is you don't need to get that cheese to update this model. You can update it constantly. And so rats like humans, are constantly making decisions based on their current prediction and state of the world. Now, the interesting thing that happens is when your predictions are wrong. If everything occurs the way you expect it, you haven't learned anything about the world. And this is where learning comes in. So we make predictions, and we're kind of making these trajectory uh, course corrections as we go along. And every time something happens that we didn't expect, something fires in our brains. It turns out that this has a lot to do with the neurotransmitter dopamine. Now, you may have heard of dopamine as a so-called pleasure chemical of the brain. And the reason it's called that, or was called that, is because for years people thought that dopamine was released in response to things like food and water and drugs and all the things that people and animals like. That's true. It is. But what's more interesting about it is that the dopamine signal is actually signaling predictions. More specifically, when the animal or the brain makes an error in prediction. And that is the signal that causes the brain to update its model of the world. Okay? Really simple and elegant neural algorithm. Okay, so what does this have to do with predicting the future? Well, if we all have these signals, these predictions rattling around our heads, if we had access to those predictions, we might be able to say something about what you're going to do. So let me tell you a little bit about how we do this with neuroimaging. Until about 20 years ago, the only way to know what someone was thinking was the two tried and true methods. You ask them what they're thinking, or you see what they do. That's it. For millennia, that's the only way you could know what a person was thinking. Clearly, there's problems with both of those, right? People don't always say what they're really thinking, and they don't always do what they say. So what's the solution? Well, if we really want to know what's in someone's head, specifically, we want to know what they're thinking is going to happen, because we want to predict the future, we have to go right into the gray matter. This is actually a picture of the first brain imaging experiment. It dates to about 1850. And what you see here is a picture of actually the very first blood pressure device. It was invented by an Italian named Angelo Masso. Not only did he put his blood pressure device on people's arms, he had the brilliant idea of putting it on people's heads, too. Now, this isn't just any old person walking around the village. This was a stonemason who had suffered a skull fracture many years before. He lived, but he always had this defect in his skull. In fact, there was a hole in his skull. It was covered with skin. And what it did was it provided a window onto the brain. And Masso had the brilliant idea of sticking his blood pressure device on this window and measuring blood pressure in the brain. Amazingly, it really worked. He was able to pick up pulsations. And what's even more interesting, those pulsations got bigger and smaller depending on what the stonemason was thinking. And that is the first imaging experiment. And what it says is that the brain, kind of like a muscle, in the sense that the parts that are working draw more blood into the area. And we can use that to measure what's happening in the brain. Think of it as sewage, though. I mean, it's kind of a secondary signal. But we can still use it and tie it to what the brain is doing. One other observation, though, before we get to the modern way that we do it, Linus Pauling discovered in the 1920s that the two forms of hemoglobin, the molecule that carries oxygen in our blood, has different magnetic signatures. If you put it in a magnetic field, if oxygen is bound to it, it doesn't really do anything. But if oxygen is not bound to it, it causes a distortion in the magnetic field. It's because of that iron in our blood. And we can use that. So our modern tool, MRI, is simply that. We put people on strong magnetic fields, and we can measure changes in blood flow as they think things, as they do things, 
as they respond to things that we give them. And that's the modern way of looking at brain function. So what good is that? Well, let me tell you, until about, oh, about five years ago, most all of the neuroimaging experiments had been focused on doing, basically trying to understand normal cognitive functions, things like memory, uh, language, um, even things like reward and punishment. And about five years ago, several groups, including ours, started looking at the possibility that there are signals in the brain that are actually predictive of what a person is going to do. So here's a picture from one of our experiments. And let me, let me just walk you through it. It's simpler than it looks. Over here on the right, what you see are these pie charts. And this is the kind of picture that we showed people while they were in the scanner. And in this task, consider these things lotteries, where the size of the pie is how much money you might get, and then the red portion says the likelihood of getting it. So people respond to these things, two dimensions, magnitude, and probability. How you respond to those, that's, a, that's an individual preference. There's no right or wrong answer. Now what's interesting is so we can, we can show people these pie charts, and they're really playing for money. And we can show them they respond to these, these lotteries, and we collect their brain responses. We can identify the brain regions that are responding to how much money you might get or the likelihood that you might get it. Now where it gets interesting is if we take those brain responses and we plug them into a computer model and ask the question, can we take the activity in these brain regions and predict that when we give that person a choice, which one are they going to pick? And so that's where we get to the probability of choosing the left or the right choice. And the answer was actually very surprising. We could predict, see these are, there's only two choices, so you could flip a coin and be right about half the time. But when we take these brain responses with no other information, we immediately jump to about 75% accuracy. If we take a little bit more information about perhaps their past choices, we can approach 100% accuracy in predicting what they're going to choose. Other groups have done similar experiments. You can ask the question, if we put a piece of chocolate in front of you and put a price on it, will you buy it? Again, it's a personal choice. Depends on how much you like chocolate. And the answer is, yeah, you can kind of tell if they're going to buy it. It's not 100% predictive, but it's clear that there are signals in the brain that are signaling value and the person's prediction of whether they want that thing or not. These are pretty remarkable studies. It's kind of mind reading. I don't like to call it that, but that's really what it is. And the fact is that we can do it with some um, statistical significance and such that it works. Uh, we can make predictions about an individual's choice. And that's pretty neat by itself. But what I really wanted to talk about is taking it to the next level. Can we predict things about culture, about society? The two things I just told you about are predicting what we would call individual choices. You know, it's a big deal. You come in, you have to go in the scanner, do a bunch of stuff. And so, you know, after all that trouble, it's, you know, kind of be surprised if it didn't work a little bit, you know, using all the high technology to predict what a person does. Most people are not going to do that, though. So we tried a different approach. Before I tell you about that, though, predicting the future um, is very popular now. You know, just plug something into Google Trends and you'll see how things are trending. The only thing I'll caution about that is that's sewage. By the time things show up in search engines, people are already doing the thing that you're interested in. And the real challenge is to try to beat that curve. So let me tell you what we did. We actually got very interested in studying music, specifically teenagers' choice in music. Somewhat arbitrary in the sense that we didn't have to study teenagers, but we had other reasons to do that. Music is interesting, and it's a good thing to study because everyone likes music. We don't all like the same music, and that's why it's interesting. We all have very strong preferences for music. The other thing that's interesting about music is that some music becomes very popular. And so 
the question was, can we use these tools, can we get inside people's brains to try to figure out what music is going to be popular? So this is how the experiment went. It took three years to do this. The idea, we started this in 2006, and we started by downloading songs from MySpace. And the reason we used MySpace is because we wanted to use artists who were relatively unknown and preferably unsigned. Because once they're signed, kids start hearing them in all sorts of places. Downloaded some songs, had a group of about 30 kids come in over the summer or over the winter between 2006 and 2007. They would go in the scanner, we'd play 15 second clips from each song, collect their brain responses, and then they, they leave. We then waited three years. And at the end of three years, we went and we collected sales data. And we saw how many units each one of those songs had sold. And then asked the question, can we use the brain data to predict the hit three years later? How do we do this? Well, the first thing is we identify the parts of the brain that are somehow related to the song. Same thing as in the picture I previously showed you. You get these areas, they're responding to measures of likability, familiarity, and then we can take those regions and again, plug them into a computer model and ask the question, can we predict the number of units sold? And the answer is, we can a little bit. Songs are, in retrospect, are very difficult to predict hits from. However, what this plot shows you, these are songs. These, each of these are individual songs. The size of the circle represents how many units were sold. And so, to be honest, all the little dots you see just kind of reaffirms that what we already know is that most music is bad. <laughs> there are a few hits, relatively. Now what the, the plot is, is actually plotting the number of units sold against the activity in two different parts of the brain. And you can see there's a pattern here. There's a relationship. You can see there's a, a linear relationship here. But the other thing to notice about it is that there are more bigger circles over here than down there. And so we start to see these statistical trends emerging that if we take our little neural focus group and identify activity here in that space, that could be a signal for a hit. OK, well, songs are cool. Can we do more? Can we predict the stock market crash? Well, I think the answer is yes. And the reason is because we're all part of groups. Whether it was a Bon Jovi concert, or Obama supporters, pilgrims to Mecca, or what's going on in Egypt and other parts of the Middle East. There is, however, one thing conspiring against this. You've all heard of the butterfly effect. I'm going to offer an alternative, which I call the fly butter effect. <laughs> the fly butter effect is that we're all flies. We're all flies sampling culture and the environment constantly. And each of us are making predictions constantly about what's going to happen. By merging this fact that we're constantly sampling culture, if we take enough people and put them in the scanner, we can start to pull out exactly these trends. And I'll argue that we can start to predict cultural shifts. We just need enough people and we need enough diversity of people. And in fact, we're starting these experiments this summer. If anyone's interested in volunteering to be part of this cohort, see me afterwards. So the question is, will it work? Well, ask me again in a year. Thank you. <laughs>